Morning, guys. It's time for Matthew 16. Uh, picking up where we left off last time on verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do you who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, uh, Caesarea Philippi is uh, an area uh, where the uh, Jordan River begins uh, up against the Golan Heights. Um, it, it's uh, an interesting area in that where he was at the time was um, right up there where the where the uh, Jordan River starts, there's a lot of pagan temples, um, including one, the first one that was there, uh, was uh, Banyas was the name of the town, which means Pan, I think it means Pan's place, but it was Pan, the Greek god Pan, which looks a lot like the representation we uh, typically see for, for Satan. So have bottom half goat, top half man with, with horns. And I think he played a flute or whatever. He was the Greek God of the shepherd and the shepherds would go to the mouth of, or go down the mouth of the Jordan, but the, the source of the Jordan is a good place for watering their sheep. So that's why they kind of settled there. But after a while, there are all kinds of temples in that area, but also in that area, right there where the river starts, there was a large grotto and it was full of water. And you can, I'll put the link over it so you can have a tour of it and you can see it for yourself. But uh, it was known as the gates of Hades. So, where Jesus is with his disciples right now is in a area full of pagan temples <laughs> and the gates of Hades, which will come into play uh, a little bit further on into the verses down here. But they didn't go actually go into the city because it was a Gentile city. It's uh, it was a center of pagan religion, as I say, as I said before, and it was at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is the foot of the Golan Heights. It's the beginning of the Jordan River, and is the Jordan River is fed by 72 streams that come down from Mount Hermon and the Golan Heights. Now, the Golan Heights is a, is a plateau, so in, uh, the water would seep down through the ground and come out through these streams and form uh, the Jordan River. Now, I heard one guy say that the water actually used to come out of the Gate of Hades, the, that grotto, but an earthquake caused that to not happen anymore. Uh, let's see what else about it. Um, it's also known as the Rock of the Gods. Uh, da -da see what I did. Anything I didn't cover? There's a lot, there was a bunch of idols. There still are some idols uh, sitting in these little alcove things in the side of the hill there. Uh, but there's nothing Jewish here. Uh, and at Jesus' time, there was people everywhere because there was a lot of pagan re religions going on there. And some of the stuff that went on there is just boggles the mind that some that anybody would think that that was a good thing to do, some of the stuff that they did. But a lot of the words that we get are from that uh, from pan, pan, pandemic, uh, pandemonium. <laughs> I don't know if pandemic is or not, actually. It just came out of my mouth. Uh, but pandemonium, when they were in the middle of their, their uh, pagan celebrations, they would be shouting and screaming and doing all kinds of uh, weird stuff that I don't even want to touch, talk about. And they called that pandemonium. Uh, Pan, they said Pan would go into the city there or the town and try to scare people to death. And that's where we get the word panic from. Um, yeah, that's good enough. There's a video that you, you can watch if you want to find out more about it, uh, that I'll put in the comments over to the second, over to the side. So when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, that's where he was, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? And, uh, the son of man, 
Um, there are lots of sons of men. If you're born of Adam, you are thought of as a son of man. And Jesus called himself a son of man because he had to, his job, one of his assignments is to redeem, redeem creation and mankind. And since God gave dominion of the earth to man in Genesis, uh, I think it was Genesis 1, um, then the only way for God to get it back and still keep his character is for man to give it to him, give it back to him. So he came as man so that he could return creation back to himself. Uh, so uh, Daniel says that Messiah will be called the son of man. This is Daniel seven thirteen through 14. Um, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So that was Daniel. Uh, but let's look at some other examples. Uh, and Psalm 8, 4 is a good example of how uh, a son of man isn't necessarily a, a good thing. <laughs> It is, this is Psalm 8, 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Well, that's not the right one. There's one that said, then thou should not trust the, uh, uh, a son of man. I put the wrong one in there. But anyway, what a son, anytime you see son of, that's what, that means you get your source from that your what I call sourced from whatever you're a son of. So son of man, it means your your source comes from man. You were born of a woman and it traced all the way back to Adam. Now, if you trace all the way back to Adam, there's some genealogies that you can go through, uh, for Jesus that would trace all the way back to Adam. And it was this son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so. And then it would say, Adam, son of God. Now, Adam was the son of God because Adam was created by God. And you'll see where angels are referred to as son of God, sons of God, uh, like in Job, where sons of God appeared before, before God. And it doesn't, being a son of doesn't necessarily mean you're a good thing. You can give birth to somebody and you're like a, somebody's son and it's, the son might be bad, but the, and the father might be good. So just because God created you and you're called a son of God does not mean that you're you're good. You can see that in Genesis 6, I think it is. Well, I'll put it to the side where it talks about the sons of God taking the daughters of Adam for wives. And a lot of people believe that sons of God there are referring to uh, angels. There's also in uh, Hebrews 7 where um, uh, Melchizedek, who was uh, a priest of God, and in Hebrews 7, it talks about how Melchizedek, Melchizedek did not have a mother or father or genealogy, but was made, made, like, made as unto a son of God or the son of God, which you can interpret to mean that it was, he was made like an angel. The angels came from God and was created by God. So Melchizedek was a man like Adam. He had to be sinless though, because he did not have a mother or a father. So he didn't, wasn't a descendant of Adam. And it says that he had no end of days, which means he never died. So, and, and the wages of sin is death. So this Melchizedek is, is making made like unto a son of God. So whenever you see this, a son of, you can see that's where you get source from. Now, Jesus was the son of, he calls it, called himself the son of man, but he was also the son of God. And that's because he got his source from two places. He got his source from Adam through, through Mary and through God. And, and not that God created him, but the relationship that this, the father and the son have is a father and son relationship. So that's why he's called the son of God. So, oof, that's a long ways, long-winded. Whom do men say that 
I, the son of man, am. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but who say ye that I am? Now, why did they think that he was John the Baptist, and Elias, and Jeremiah? Well, he could have looked like John because they were cousins. That's one, one confusion. Uh, they also both preached the same message. Jesus was picking up where John left off when he was in prison. You can see that in Mark 1, 14 through 15, where it says, Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That was the same message that John was preaching. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, this is Matthew, uh, in Matthew 3, 1 through 4, it says, In those days John came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now, Elijah wore the same outfit. <laughs> so I don't know about it meeting locusts and wild honey, but but Elias, Elias had, had the same outfit that John did. He had, and I think I got a scripture verse that proves that. Let's see. So that's one reason that people got confused. Uh, second Kings, yeah, second Kings one through eight, oh, second Kings one, eight. And they answered him they asked to who, what did this guy look like? Was Elijah, they asked this guy what Elijah looked like. And he, they answered him. He was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite it was, uh, uh, Like one of the kings. Uh, I can't remember which one. can't remember his name right now. Okay, let's get back. So, people, a lot of people were confused about who Jesus was. Some said it was John the Baptist. Some said it was Elias. Some said it was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. And I think the, the shortest verse in the Bible was Jesus wept. Uh, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Now this is what typically what uh, rabbis would say when the, a student got something right. They would say, Blessed art thou. <laughs> Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Simon Barjona. Bar means son of, so Simon Barjona is just a way of saying Simon, son of Jonas. Uh, so let's see, let's see what I got in my notes here on Blessed Art Thou. Uh, yes, the blessed is just a note about the rabbis. Um, so, blessed art thou, Simon of Argentina, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there they are, where the gates of Hades is. <laughs> so he's saying the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, there's a lot in this verse. First of all, this is the big verse for how the Catholics, one of the big verses for how the Catholics have decided that Peter was the first Pope because Jesus said that they were, he was going to build his church on Peter. But if you look <clears throat> at what these words are in the Greek, you can't come to that conclusion. Because when he says, when he calls Simon Peter, he uses the word Petros, which is a masculine and it means a small rock. Uh, so he's, he is calling him the rock. And then he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, the word rock there is not the same word. It's not Petros, it's Petras. And it means a large cliff or a large, very large rock. So it's not P 
Peter he's building his church on is something else. So what is that something else? And I can't help but believe because of there being, there's over 50 verses in scripture that says that you are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's also in Romans 9, uh, Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was is Lord and was raised from the dead, you will be saved. So, and Jesus, and Peter just got through saying, uh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So I, I can't, I don't see how anybody can come to the conclusion other than that, that the church is built on the confession of faith that Jesus is Lord, the Son of the living God, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, also in there, this verse, it says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, it, it's our nature that when we when we hear that, I think it's the enemy kind of twisting, twisting the words, makes us think that hell is on the offensive and we're on the defensive. But the gates of a city is where the, the officials sat. And it was a defensive position. They closed the gates at night to keep the enemy out. And it was what was attacked. When you were attacking the city, you attacked the gates because that's the way into the city. So when you, it says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it means the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the church. The church is assaulting hell, not the other way around. And the interesting thing about all this is that if you go to Caesarea Philippi, where all these pagan worship was going on and all these different temples were built, all these different idols were set up. There's nothing there anymore. There's there's remnants. <laughs> the water's not in the cave anymore, the grotto. Uh, they're not sacrificing goats and throwing them in there anymore. So it's it's kind of a shadow of, of what's going to happen in the future uh, spiritually. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and that is very interesting that it was uh singular so the he was talking specifically to peter in this situation but we can tell that it this carries over to other people but but in, at least initially, the keys of the kingdom were given to uh, Peter. Now, Peter, this does not mean that Peter is, this is the other verse that the Catholics used to say that Peter is the first pope. But if you got, if you go by that, then you got to go by what Jesus said a little bit later when he, when G, when Peter tried to keep him, rebuked him for saying that he was going to the cross to die and said, get ye behind me, Satan. <laughs> You're going to say Peter was Peter was the first pope, and you might have to say the the pope might be satanic. <laughs> Since it's get ye behind me, Satan was to the, said to the first pope. But anyway, right, we'll get into that. That's not what it was. he wasn't calling Peter Satan, and we'll, we'll we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but if you think it's just for Peter, you can see that it's not so in Matthew 18, 18, where it says, verily, verily, I say unto you, and the, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall, uh, shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's rever uh, referring to that again. But in this case, he's not talking to Peter. He's talking to, um, the believers. Let's, let's go back a little bit. Um, let's talk about church discipline here also. Uh, well, let's start with verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more than in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. 
And so in other words, you, if you got something against your brother, you go, you talk to him about it. If you don't get it ironed out, then you go get a couple of other brothers and go back and talk to him again so that you can have witnesses for, for later on, if you need them and the witnesses for church discipline. Uh, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven." Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. So that's instruction to believers in the church where church members can bind and loose. Uh, let's see, let's go back. To... Okay, so Peter was given the keys to, to, uh, to heaven the kingdom of heaven. So what do you do with keys? You, you use keys to let people in and to keep people out. In this case, they were letting people in and Peter did, what was the first one to use for the keys to the kingdom? You can see this in, in Acts 2, uh, where Pentecost happens and Peter preaches the first sermon and the first 3,000 believers, first 3,000 into the, into the church happened. Uh, and you can also see in Acts 10, where Peter is the first one to get Gentiles into the church. And let's see, authority or keys, this is Luke 9, 1. Peter was not, uh, oh yeah. So Peter was really the first of that kind. We talked about Little Rock. Peter, I'll call you, your name is Peter, which is little rock, and upon this big rock, I will build my church. So every time somebody is born again, there's another another small rock that's part of the church that's added onto the foundation. And the foundation is Jesus Christ, and it's the confession of faith that Jesus is Lord, is, is the Son of God. So Peter was the first of that kind. You can see Peter isn't the Pope from later in this verse, and I just talked about that. Also, the disciples that didn't treat Oh, yeah, the disciples didn't treat Peter as the leader. This is another evidence that Peter wasn't the first pope. As a matter of fact, later they argued over who was greater in Matthew 18. And, and then Paul rebukes Peter in Galatians 2. So if Paul was, uh, Peter was the pope, Paul wouldn't be rebuking him. So you who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you are the one who gets the keys to the kingdom. So we all get the keys to the kingdom now because we can all we're all ambassadors of Christ. Uh, he has commissioned all of us to present to uh, to uh, commissioned all who believe to make disciples of all. You read that in Matthew twenty eight. It wasn't true at the time that. He was talking to Peter here, but in Matthew 28, this is going to all the world, making disciples of all men, baptizing them, immersing them into the reality of the Holy Spirit, uh, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have taught you. So what did he teach? Jesus taught, Jesus taught how, taught uh, to love your neighbor, that fulfills the, the law, uh, raise the dead, heal the sick, kick out demons, cleanse the leper, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, which is not a, a present, it's not a um, proclamation, <laughs> as most of us have done. It's, it's instructions to immerse them into the reality of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You, you can see that in the Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible is probably the, the best one for reading that verse in. And... So that's, uh, let's see, okay, where were we at? Okay, binding and loosing. Whatever you shall bind on earth is all, this is the way it reads in verb tense is whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. A lot of people want to teach it that, 
whatever you bind has to be already bound in heaven. And what's loose, what you're loosed has got to already have been loosed in heaven. But that's not the way it reads. It reads that whatever you bind on earth is loose, is already bound in heaven, meaning that it's your decision and heaven has got your back. So you're the one that's doing, making the decisions. That's another good reason why it's not just for Peter. <laughs> it's just one man doing that. It's a lot of power. <laughs> but if the whole church is doing it, it's something different. Uh, but binding and loosing, um, are just terms for tying up and untying and tying things to things and loosing things from things. So you can binding and loosing in itself isn't bad or good. It depends on what you're binding and loosing. You can bind the enemy uh, from doing something, or you can loose somebody from the enemy, but you can also bind something to heaven uh, for instance, when Jesus multiplied the loaves, I think he was binding, and the fish, he was binding the fish and the loaves to to heaven, which allowed for multiplication, or, uh, the law of plenty to work. And I think that's what the uh, um, prophets did also. But here's some examples of binding and loosing, uh, so that it doesn't sound so mystical, I guess. Uh, Mark 5, 3 who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. This was the demoniac that was in the tombs. He, they couldn't bind him with chains. So they're using this, that's the same word, bind. Uh, let's see, this is Acts 9, 14. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So this is where, I believe this is a, well, let me jump to it. I think it's, this is Paul. Yeah, Saul. Saul had was given authority to bind those that called on the name of Jesus, which means imprisoned. Another one. This is Acts 21 11. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So was, there was a warning to Paul that if he goes to Jerusalem, he was going to be imprisoned. And loose, I thought was really interesting. Uh, some of the verses there, the Lord said, answered him and said, thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham who whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. <laughs> I love the word ashamed there in the Greek is carries the imagery of somebody being caught naked <laughs> and having to run away because it was that they were naked so they, they retreat they retreat because they're they've been exposed or that they're naked is the idea behind ashamed there uh so let's go back to the next one which is x oh and what was the reason for jesus saying that this the woman should be loosed satan had bound her so he's saying satan makes people sick and he's saying that she was a daughter of Abraham, and since she was a daughter of Abraham, she should be loosed from her infirmity. Now, we we have the blessings of Abraham, too, if we're believers. So if we're sick, we should be loosed from Satan, just as this woman should be loosed. So what went for this woman should be going for us as believers, since we are uh, have the, the, the blessings of Abraham. So this uh, this is Acts sixteen eleven. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, 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 and the next day to Neapolis. So they were they were being loosed. That's half an hour. They were being uh, the ship. It's a term they use for loosing somebody from from a mooring. 
And it, that's an interesting way of looking at it. If you look at the woman who was bent over and who was bound by Satan and she was loosed from her infirmity, it was like she left dock. She was untied from her infirmity and that the, the, she was at the, the dock of, of infirmity and she was let loose from it. So she was free and out the sea. But you can also be bound to uh, an island of heaven or uh, the shore of heaven where heaven has an effect on you. So it's, it's a very visual way of looking at it. It's kind of a way of meditating on it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. This is Romans 7, 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. And this is 1 Corinthians seven twenty seven. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So, and I will give thee, give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And that's a good place to stop. So next time, Matthew sixteen twenty. <sighs> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be saved. See you guys.